Uh, this is the so-called pyramid with the shining eye. Even Jim used it for his new bestseller. So it means it is a very, very famous, but also very, very old symbol. And this is the only existing really pyramid with the eye. It has exactly 13 steps, like the pyramid on the one US dollar. The strange thing with this one and other artifacts found in Ecuador, that if you put black light on it, the eye shines really very, very strong. And the natural color is kind of light green and gray. And the most impressive for me was that on the bottom of the pyramid, you have here in gold inlays the Orion constellation and an unknown writing. This unknown writing we found on stones all over the world. In Ecuador, in Colombia, in Illinois, in Glossel, France, in Calabria, Italy, in Turkmenistan, in Malta, and Rex Gilroy, Gilroy has some pictures on his uh, website, and I found out that some of the stones he shows with unknown writing presents the same writing. That means there must have existed a global civilization long, long time ago. And there was only one man able to translate this language, Professor Kurt Schildmann. He was the president of the German Linguistic Association. He spoke and wrote more than 40 languages perfect. And he could translate this writing, and he called it pre-Sanskrit, because it's older than the oldest writing. And the translation of these four letters on the bottom of the pyramid. Guys, this image was the last one that we got from Hubble, and it was uh, on the video a few weeks ago. And they did an overlay of three images to get this coloration that you see in here. They used uh, blue, red, and I think the black and white filter took the shots and overlaid them. And we came out, and they said it was a smooth image. And... The video that I did where we were watching the meeting, if you remember, of the different astronomers and scientists on, at the IC meeting, the uh, Comet ISUN meeting, and one of the guys at the end said that the jets were irregular. They were not, uh, they were at a distinct angle from the sun. Well, <clears throat> and again, I was complaining that if they were getting shots every 15 minutes of Hubble, from Hubble, why aren't we getting more? Well, what I wanted to do was find the images that they used to make this composite. Now, when they overlaid this, they smoothed a lot of edges out. Is, was that the purpose? To make it look like one object, guys? Is that what they're doing? I want to dig a little deeper here. Now, I found the three images that they used to make this picture. And now I think I know why. I'm going to pull this over. This is the black and white one. This is from the red filter and the green filter here. I'm going to pull this black and white up, guys. Just hang in there a minute. To, uh, see what we got. Now, without the overlay and what they've added in, you can see what's inside this comet or inside this uh, coma, coma haze here. You have three objects. <clears throat> and this is not an object behind these two you see how this cloud is irregular this will not be happening now this is what's called the Hubble web viewer and I'm gonna put it up after I load the video you can't put links in the description until after the video is loaded so sometimes it takes about 10 minutes to get that information under it but uh, this is called the iSign web viewer or image web image viewer and uh, you notice uh, the numbers here as you move your cursor around it gives you where you're at you see that now it also has what's called invert darker and lighter you notice how they've got it real bright now this is the released image here and at this Sun this star appears to be having a solar flare or coronal mass ejection out the side but let's try to get it Let's just uh, darken this thing a couple times. And again, I'm going to link this. You notice that it's starting to clear up. 
that was overexposed, the one that was released. Here's eye sign. Here's your coronal mass ejection. That's what's inside that coma. Now, that looks like a comet. This, I don't know, but again, it's part of this cloud. We'll pull it up. You can also zoom, and it will zoom very big. One more time. Now let's go back to let's go to light and let's blur it out the way that it was when you go to the page. As we lighten it up, it's just increasing your uh, exposure time, basically. Watch what happens to it. You still see that uh, oblong shape? inside that coma there's about the way we get it now we're going to go back dark right there now remember that one scientist said some of the jets are not pointed right are there, is that a, is that what we're looking at here guys something's just not right you, I would say this was some kind of marker or something if it was not for this cloud. Pull it up. Let's look at it close. This is the real image of what's inside that cloud. I'm going to go darker. Hello, I'm John Coleman, and the name of this presentation is There Is No Significant Global Warming. And I'm the guy that is just doggone sure of that. Now, you may think that I'm just a paid-off shill, big oil, or something of that sort. No, 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 no. They've never given me a nickel. I'm a television weathercaster with 60 years' experience, a meteorologist. Uh, I was the first weatherman on Good Morning America. I'm the man who founded the Weather Channel. And this is my accomplishment. Broadcast Meteorologist of the Year from the American Meteorological Society, of which I was a professional member for many years. I finally quit the AMS when it became very clear to me that the politics had gotten in the way of the science and it was time to talk about something else. Now, did we have a winter or what in 2013, 14? Oh man, did we ever. When I called for my brother in Ohio, his wife said he wasn't coming in from shoveling the snow to talk to some guy in California. Oh, man, how could you tout global warming when it was the coldest, snowiest, bitterest winter in 30 years, which it was across the United States? And it would take a lot of gall to put out a statement as our NOAA, the National Oceanographic and, and Atmospheric Agency did, claiming that it was the warm, 2013 was the, the warmest year. I mean, sheer silliness. It is manipulation of the data. Now look, let's get something clear right from the beginning. I love this planet Earth. I've been a citizen of this Earth now for darn near 80 years, and it's all I got. If I thought that we, mankind, were damaging this beautiful little sphere, this blue marble on which we live, I would be terrified and give every ounce of energy I had to stop what we were doing. But I have studied the issues of so-called global warming, or now they call it climate change since the warming has stopped. I have studied the issues carefully and completely as a good scientist can and reached an absolute firm conclusion that there is no global warming. Now this Earth, it's spinning around the sun at 17,000 miles per hour. It is traveling with the sun. Uh, in our little sh uh, spiral off the Milky Way galaxy at uh, over 100,000 miles an hour. And that galaxy is flying out in the universe as the Big Bang continues to expand the universe. And we are all traveling very, very fast. And what a ride. The Earth has been traveling for four and a half billion years. And as best I can tell, it's going to stay just fine for another four billion years. But wait a minute. During that period, we have had ice ages 
and we have had interglacial periods, and we're going to continue to have those natural variations in climate. But man-made climate change, I'm sure it's not gonna happen. That's why I sent out this tweet today. This tweet went out to Al Gore. It went out to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change of the United Nations, to the Sierra Club, to the Democratic Party uh, National Committee. And what it said is, where is your so-called global warming? Because if you chart the temperatures, you can go back into the 70s and come up to today, and there's almost no warming. I mean, less than one degree warming since 1978, and absolutely no warming since 1998. What kind of deal is that? Well, I'll tell you what kind of deal it is. It's the kind of deal that's full of silliness if you're promoting climate change and global warming. We are in one of the most stable and beautiful periods of Earth's climate you could hope for. And look at the stark contrast between the spaghetti of the many models of atmospheric warming created by various uh, people who have gotten tens of millions of dollars of federal grant money and worked for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and there's the average of all their models, and then here's the real temperatures as measured both on Earth and with our satellites. And <laughs> folks, it's just not happening. That's why I posted on Facebook this memo today to the scientists and organizations that take that $4.7 billion a year of tax money to continue your so-called global warming research. And I say to them, it's bad science. Ladies and gentlemen, please cease and desist the global warming and climate change scare campaign. It's harmful to the continued advancement of our civilization. The government actions to counter so-called carbon pollution have already raised the cost of fuel, electricity, and food by an average of $1,000 a year for the average American family of four. And the $4.7 billion of our tax money a year being issued to you and your organizations is funding a wide range of meaningless studies based on this bad science that says that carbon dioxide radiative forcing is causing warming. That money could be productively spent on energy research, including graphene and thorium and other new energy sources. Your manipulated climate computer models have dramatically failed both in temperature predictions and their predicted warming signatures. Please admit your errors. It's time to put principle and and, and that above personal wealth and status and help restore basic scientific principles to climate research. So I posted the memo and I sent the tweet. But you know, I know that you are highly skeptical of what I'm saying. How can you believe me when you see this constant stream of global warming news reports day after day, year after year, printed on the internet sites, uh, in all the newspapers, they still print with ink on paper and roll it up and throw it in your driveway and uh, send it in a magazine. And it's full of this stuff. I mean, it's just full of it. Even our, our government, our National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Agency of the federal government is, has established websites to promote climate change. And of course, the New York Times, it's been leading that all along. And that's the power of money. That $4.7 billion a year is buying all of this bogus research that is leading to all of these bogus reports. So let me just give you the hard cold facts. I showed you this when I tweeted it. There isn't any warming going on. There hasn't been. Nothing significant is happening. Oh, we have extreme natural variations in temperature. That's a hard cold fact. But this recent warming, it's no different than the warming that has occurred many times before naturally. We had a, a medieval optimum uh, when the Roman Empire flourished, and we had the little ice age when times were very tough. This little warming we have now, gosh, that's no big deal. That's just no big deal. Now you want to talk about big deals. This is a hard cold fact. Uh, from the ice cores, uh, we have determined that we have vacillated on Earth between extreme ice ages and these beautiful interglacial periods of warming weather. And we live in the most recent of these interglacial periods. We've been in it for 12,000 years. Probably have another 10, 12,000 years to go before the next ice age comes on, naturally. 
And can we cope with that? Now you hear about uh, the ice melting at the North Pole. What ice melted at the North Pole? Well, it got pretty low in 2007, but this is the last bunch of years since we've had satellite observation. We've had it for about 35 years. And here's where the ice is now, and it's no big deal. And those polar bears, <laughs> there are more polar bears living today than have been alive any time since we've been counting them. And they are living all around the North Pole in 19 populations. They're doing just fine. That's a hard, cold fact. How about the South Pole? Well, our South Pole, is, as I record this, is in summertime. So the ice melt is near the peak for the season. But you'll note it's well of more ice there than above average. It's near an all-time high. Oh, but the water is rising along the coast. Oh, is that right? Well, it's rising at the rate of about six inches per hundred years as part of this interglacial period. I mean, when, when the North America was covered in a 400-foot thick ice core at the end of the last ice age, the oceans were low, and then they, as that ice melted, of course, the oceans have risen, but that rise has been gentle and it's not important. And then, oh, superstorms. We didn't have a hurricane hit the U.S. in 2013. Uh, the year before, only a meager effort. And that so-called Superstorm Sandy, it was no big deal as hurricanes go. It didn't compare with Katrina, didn't compare with Andrew, and neither of those compared with the Galveston hurricane of 1900, long before man had any influence on climate. Oh, but tornadoes. How about those tornadoes? Well, here's the chart of tornadoes. Strong tornadoes have been diminishing. I mean, we now have so many good radars, and everybody's taking pictures with their phone. We see every tornado, it seems, that forms. But folks, uh, there are fewer and less strong. Oh, and drought. Well, we had a big drought in Texas. It vanished. Now we have a big drought in California, getting a lot of publicity. If you look at the records, California falls into drought about once every 11, 12 years. And then we get an El Nino, and California gets the rain, comes out of the drought. I mean, we've got 40 million people living in a desert. <laughs> of course they're going to have a water problem. So what? Uh, it's, it's natural. It's not man-made. And it, it comes and it goes. It takes care of itself. Heat waves? What heat waves? We haven't had a killer heat wave since the 50s. So I've plotted all these hard, cold facts and presented them to you. And then I compare them to what you read in the press, what you hear on the air, what the networks tout. And you say, man, what a difference between reality and what's there. Does Coleman know his reality? You bet I do, folks. I study it every day. But how did this strange, strange bad science, how did this global warming, climate change, euphor uh, this crisis, how did it get started? Well, that's the story I'm going to tell you today. And that story begins with this great scientist, a man named Roger Revelle, who uh, was a graduate of the University of California, Berkeley, in oceanography, who then served in the Navy during World War II, and then became the director of the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and who led research on the environmental impact of the atomic test on those atolls out in the Pacific following World War II, both atmospheric and ocean impact. And as that was coming to an end, uh, he had uh, greatly grown the Scripps Oceanographic Institution from a, you know, an isolated small organization to a huge uh, professional organization with many ships and hundreds of employees. It became clear he had to have something new to work on. And that's when he uh, decided that uh, something had to give. So he hired this man, Hans Seuss, a professor from the University of Chicago who had done studies on the effect of carbon in the atmosphere. And uh, Ravel thought maybe there was something to that. So he and Seuss did a research paper, and they put it out, in which they asked the question, is mankind's burning of fossil fuels to uh, you know, the coal in our stokers that were uh, heating our homes, the uh, oil in our cars, the fuel, uh, old-fashioned gasoline in old-fashioned cars, uh, was all of that creating a climate issue? And, uh, you know, we were, this was the 1950s, folks. And the world was pretty well caught in a smog. I remember it as a boy. Most of you are probably too young to remember. But I gotta tell you, 
uh, you choked in the in the smog that hung over your towns during the winter months when those all those stole, uh, coal burning stokers were going, and uh, the cars were just spewing out ash, and it was ugly because we were burning old fashioned untreated fuels in old fashioned cars. Well, that was the beginning. That paper that Seuss and Ravel put out is actually the paper that started the global warming frenzy. Oh man, did they start something. And uh, Ravel then, he became a powerful man as a basis of that. His science was used all over the world by other scientists. And uh, he started campaigning to establish a campus of the University of California uh, co-located with his Scripps Oceanographic Institution at La Jolla, California. That was a big darn deal. Well, guess what happened? It was located there, but something happened. Ravel suffered the greatest defeat of his life. He had campaigned to get that university there and thought he would be its first chancellor, but the politics backfired on him, and he wasn't named chancellor of that university, and he was hurt. So what did he do? He suddenly made a big move. He changed her. The only science class Al Gore ever took, Ravel didn't remember having him in class. But oh, Al Gore, who got a D in the course, was highly impressed. He was the son of a politician out of Tennessee, and he used what he learned there to start his global warming campaign. He wrote a book called Earth in the Balance. He ran for the U.S. Senate. He claimed that you know, the Earth was being challenged by our burning of fossil fuels, and he got him elected to the U.S. Senate. And there in the Senate, he conducted hearings, bringing in scientists, and spreading the scare of global warming. And that's when the money began to flow from the government to research. And this was the booby trap. Because once billions of dollars of government funding was going out to these organizations and universities and research groups across the nation, uh, and they had to sh back that global warming claim that uh, Al Gore was promoting with their research, the research began to pile up. And if you were a young scientist, you didn't have a choice. You couldn't put out a research paper and said, oh, what warming? You'd be out of a job. You'd lose your job, your car, your family. You'd be walking on the streets. No, you had to support it. Al Gore had taken Ravel and Seuss's research paper and used it to start the global warming campaign. And what did Al Gore say? He said, this is Roger Ravel. He was my mentor. He's my hero. He's the man who spread the alarm. Well, there was another man that picked that up. This man, Maurice Strong. Maurice had become a bureaucrat at the United Nations. And in 1972, he had a conference in Stockholm on the environment. And he, his whole goal was a one world government. And he used that the impetus of that global warming scare at that Stockholm conference to start the initiative that set up the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So now we had the U.S. government and the United Nations both promoting climate change, and it all came from that Ravel Seuss paper and the research that followed and the dollars that were now flowing, and man, it was underway big time. So the IPPC it had scientists and bureaucrats and politicians from throughout the world. Uh, it had the World Wildlife Federation, the Sierra Club, all the environmentalists, and they all got together and they voted that global warming was for real. Well, I gotta tell you something, you don't settle science by a vote. <laughs> it's not a political issue, it's not a vote, it's science. Uh, but never mind, they put out their reports and they spent a lot of time telling us how we were destroying planet Earth. And they had fancy meetings in tropical uh, locations throughout the world. And the scientists uh, who supported global warming got the paid vacation trips to these big meetings and got to write these books and have their names and their careers. And man, it was a big deal. And what did Al Gore do? Well, he wrote a second book about global warming called an inconvenient truth, and we all know what became of that. His liberal friends in Hollywood turned that into a documentary, a sci-fi documentary, I might add, all about global warming, and uh, they voted themselves a Oscar, best documentary film of the year in 2007, 
And then they turned around and Al Gore stood by the IPCC president and they got the Nobel Peace Prize, all for scaring us about global warming. So Gore's movie, An Inconvenient Truth, became an absolute mainstay in American schools. How many times did you see it when you were going to school? Over and over and over again. And the global warming frenzy had truly reached its peak when all of that happened. Well, what happened with this man, Roger Revell, who had started it all, the great scientist? Well, he had kind of lost interest in this population study center at Harvard and missed San Diego, I guess, in the beautiful Southern California climate. And he swallowed hard for his defeat there. And he came back to the University of California, San Diego, as a professor. And there, there he wrote these letters. And I want you to look at them. The first one goes from his desk to U.S. Congressman Tim Worth. Quote, we should be careful not to arouse too much alarm about the rate and amount of warming before it comes clear. And he wrote another letter here to Congressman Tim Bates. Most scientists familiar with the subject are not yet willing to bet the climate this year is the result of greenhouse warming. As you very well know, climate is highly variable year to year. The causes of these variations are not at all well understood. My own personal belief is that we should wait another 10 to 20 years to really be convinced that the greenhouse is going to be important for human beings in both positive and negative ways. So there it was. The man who had started the global warming campaign had put up the flag of warning. Hey folks, this may not be for real. Caution, caution. Well, he even wrote an article that was published in a new science magazine called Cosmos. And he teamed with a uh, professor, uh, Fred Singer, to write that article. And that article was called, What to Do About Greenhouse Warming? Look Before You Leap. And the article concluded, and I quote, the scientific basis for a greenhouse warming is too uncertain to justify drastic action at this time. Wow. The man who had started it? Well, how did Al Gore react to that? Well, he said, I've made up my mind. Ravel is now senile. Pay no attention to that. The debate is over. And you've been hearing that now for 20 years. Al Gore won't debate anybody. And he claims it's for real. Well, we lost Roger Ravel. The fight had to go on without him. He passed away of a heart attack in 1991. Uh, and after he died, uh, his family joined with the people at Scripps to make him the father of global warming. Uh, they, they rejected his denialism, and so did the UN IPCC. But Dr. Singer, he was made to be uh, the scapegoat for it all. They said he had caused it. Well, I finally was able to interview Dr. Singer about this controversy. He joins us live from Washington, D.C., Dr. Singer. What was Roger Revelle's view of carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas when you co-authored that Cosmos article back in 1990? Uh, he was very relaxed about it. He basically uh, looked at this as a grand geophysical experiment. After he and his collaborators like uh, David Keeling found that CO2 was in fact increasing in the atmosphere. He and his colleagues were wondering if it would have any impact on climate. He wasn't about to make any judgment on the matter until the data were in. Of course at that time by 1990 we had about more than 10 years worth of satellite data and the satellites didn't show any appreciable warming. And this is what actually set off my own thinking on the matter. I wondered why, why what, was, what was going on? After all, carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. It's increasing. There's no question about that. Where is the warming? Well, it turns out that the atmosphere is much more complicated than the climate models believe. And uh, the warming is offset, probably, by a kind of negative feedback that comes from clouds and water vapor in the atmosphere. Well, are you saying that back in 1990 that Ravel was uh, 
somewhat regretful of the excitement that he had caused about global warming? Uh, Ravel, um, at that time, had written some letters to his congressman and also to Senator Worth, uh, telling him to calm down, not get excited about it, but wait and see what would happen to the climate. In other words, he was telling him, don't assume that things are going to warm up just because the models say so. Ravel actually was very skeptical of climate models, much more so than, than I was. I was always more optimistic, hoping that they would improve enough so that they could really simulate what's going on in the atmosphere. Ravel had not much faith in models. Well, since that time, many people have said that you were the one who manipulated Ravel, uh, that uh, you kind of calmed him down or changed his feelings in the way you put that article together, that uh, Gore said he was a senile old man when you co-authored that paper and that uh, therefore you took your position on CO2 and more or less assigned it to Ravel and uh, they put a lot of blame on you. Well, that's absolutely untrue. First of all, if you knew Ravel, uh, you would know that he was sharp to the very, very end and you could not change his mind. I mean, he, he knew what he was doing all the time. And furthermore, we have written proof. We have the letters he wrote to his congressman and to his senator we also have an interview in Omni magazine. Uh, so there's plenty of evidence to show that he was quite independent-minded and that he didn't believe in global warming un until the data would show him a warming. And by 1990, they really weren't. That did, is, the satellite data were not showing the warming. Did uh, you and Ravel talk about Gore at all? Actually, no, we never did. Uh, come to think of it. Uh, we, we only discussed the science. Um, Ravel's politics was very different from mine. He was, a, I think, a supporter of Gore. Uh, he was a, a, a liberal Democrat uh, by inclination and I think uh, in every other way. But when it came to science, we completely agreed. Interview that I <laughs> did, had did you, uh, uh, with uh, Dr. Singer now, he's not the only scientist, please understand this, who questions this global warming frenzy, this climate change scare. In fact, there are 9,000 PhDs that have signed a petition denying that CO2 is causing global warming. There's 31,000 scientists in total who have signed that petition. Uh, there is a whole organization of them, uh, a, a huge group from NASA recently wrote to the United Nations and to the U.S. at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, Al Gore was a hero, and they proved it. They gave him the first Roger Revelle Award. Honored tonight at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, he was given an award in recognition of his environmental work. KUSI's Tom Jordan is live in La Jolla with more on that. Tom? Paul, Al Gore was the first ever recipient of the Roger Revelle Prize here at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, honored tonight for his work in environmental preservation. A rousing welcome for a man continuing his campaign on environmental awareness and protection. Former Vice President Al Gore being honored for his efforts with the first ever Roger Revelle Prize. I want to um, express my very deep and genuine gratitude uh, for this honor. The award presented at this dinner marking the 100th birthday of the late Roger Revelle, who headed Scripps Institution of Oceanography from 1950 to 1964. Gore studied under Revelle at Harvard University in the 1960s and credits him for igniting his passion on the environment. As a, as a former student, still a student, trying to learn but still inspired by a great teacher who was a great scientist and a great man. Roger Revelle's work back in the 1960s was at the time considered revolutionary. Today, many scientists consider that work almost prophetic. And at that time, they wrote a short report, and we were told it was a very short report, saying that climate change is becoming an issue, the Earth is heating up, and therefore, something needs to be done about that. Al Gore says he was deeply moved by Revelle's early work. 
He now considered at the forefront of the global warming movement. A Nobel Peace Prize winner and Oscar winning documentarian, all from his work on the environment. Now he adds a new distinguished and personal honor to that list. I am deeply, deeply grateful. And tonight's celebration was part of three days of celebrating the life of Roger Revelle. Roger Revelle would have been 100 years old tomorrow. We are live in La Jolla. I'm Tom Jordan, KUSI News. Thanks, Tom. John Coleman believes there is no significant man-made global warming, and he travels the nation speaking on the topic. John has some insights now on Roger Revelle's scientific research and the effect that it had on Al Gore. John? Well, Revelle was a powerful man, a noteworthy scientist, and a significant force here in San Diego in the 1950s. There's no doubt that he's largely responsible for the high status of the Scripps Institute of Oceanography in its field and for locating the University of California of San Diego, UCSD, at La Jolla. While serving as director of Scripps, Ravel and one of his researchers wrote the first modern scientific paper that linked carbon dioxide released in the air from the burning of fossil fuels and the greenhouse effect and the warming of temperatures. Well, this triggered an avalanche of research that eventually became the impetus behind the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and the entire global warming movement. In the 1960s, Ravel moved to Harvard to establish a center for population studies. This is where Professor Ravel encountered student Albert Gore. He involved Gore and his classmates in the tabulating of data from a carbon dioxide study. Gore was so impressed, he wrote about it in his 1992 book, Earth in the Balance. That became the story for the movie, An Inconvenient Truth. The Oscar and the Nobel Peace Prize, and some people say $100 million, all came from that. There is no doubt Roger Revelle had a major impact on Vice President Gore's life. But there's a twist. In 1988, Roger Revelle was having second thoughts about whether carbon dioxide was a significant greenhouse gas. He wrote letters to two congressmen about it. And in 1991, he co-authored a report for the new science magazine Cosmos, in which he expressed his strong doubts about global warming and urged more research before any remedial action was taken. At that point, Mr. Gore pronounced Ravel senile and refused to debate global warming. He continues to refuse to debate. Many offers of thousands of dollars have been made for debate. He refuses. Today, Gore sequestered the media at this event, and he set forth rules, no questions, no interviews. I have learned that in 1991, Roger Ravel made what was his final speech at the high-powered, very private summer enclave of powerful men and politicians at the Bohemian Grove in Northern California. There he apologized for his research, for sending so many people in the wrong direction on global warming, and he worried about the political fallout from the UNIPCC and Al Gore. A man named Don Michael Schmedman, who lives in the San Francisco area, was there that day, and he remembers the Ravel speech very well. He has told me about it in some detail. So think of the irony today. Al Gore received the first Roger Ravel Award, honoring the man who sent him on his global warming campaign. But Ravel had realized that it was a false alarm and that the science was flawed before he died. Ravel died of a heart attack in 1991. It would be interesting to know that if he had lived, would he be approving of the award that was given tonight? Or perhaps would he be joining me at the International Conference of Global Warming Skeptics in New York next week? If you want to read the article on global warming that I have written, you can go to KUSI.com, click on Coleman's Corner. Paul, now, this is Colin? really interesting. We haven't heard this information at all before. Well, I've done a lot of digging over the last year to uh, find all of this. And it really fascinated me when I stumbled across the Bohemian Grove speech. It's not documented anywhere. This is uh, the first time your orbits have crossed, you and Al Gore. They've, you're both in the same city for 24 hours, and we couldn't get the two of you to meet. Well, no, Mr. Gore, of course, is, was a former vice president. He's a man who got 52 million votes for president, served very honorably as a politician. I think he would have little regard for me. But you'd like to debate him, wouldn't you? Well, sure, I'd love to debate him, but you understand, this isn't political. I'm a journalist and a meteorologist. My interest is... Strictly in the science. science. Thank you, John. Thanks. So that's the report. 
And I'm sure you're wondering, why haven't I heard all of this before? Why isn't the media full of it? Why do I keep hearing about global warming and its threat to our civilization? Well, it's $4.7 billion a year of our tax money, and that's the power of money. Now, everything I've had in this report is posted, including the complete interview with uh, Dr. Singer. You only saw part of that interview. That complete interview and a lot of other material is posted on my Coleman's Corner website at KUSI.com, Coleman's Corner. Now, uh, I would be delighted to have you look there. I'm also a, a regular reader of a site called What's Up With That, where my friend uh, Anthony Watts hosts any number of skeptical papers on global warming. The research flows there on a daily basis. Uh, now, what's going to defeat this global warming scare? I don't think we... <laughs> it's, like a, it's like David and Goliath. I don't think we can defeat $4.7 billion, the Democrat Party, the United Nations, uh, and uh, the Sierra Club and the Wildlife Federation and all of them. Uh, they just claim that we're deniers and uh, old goats. <laughs> and they, they think we're bought and paid for by the, by the, the uh, big oil companies, which we are not. Uh, don't have anything to do with them. But uh, I don't think we can defeat them. You know what's going to defeat them? Time. A few more bitterly cold winters, a turn toward a colder climate, when the global warming fails to materialize in time, people will begin to believe. And I have noted that recent, a recent Gallup poll shows that more and more people are saying, global warming, that's not the big deal. Uh, we got a lot of big deals going on, you know, employment, uh, uh, jobs, uh, government too big, that sort of thing. Uh, the list of their concerns is very interesting. Those are on it. But global warming's down toward the bottom of the list.